Uh, so, uh, as Stephen mentioned, my name is Becky Kinkert, and uh, I am one of those London speakers that he spoke of. Uh, however, my accent may not appear to be London, that's because I'm actually from Texas. So, I am an American in disguise of a Londoner. Do not be fooled. Um, I am here to talk to you today, um, as Stephen mentioned, about uh, going mobile and into the cloud. Okay, now. The thing that I want to tell you guys, you probably all already know this, but because we're going to assume we've got a mix of folks, um, social engineering trumps everything. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you apply in terms of you know, hardening, antivirus, firewall, IPS, encryption. At the end of the day, all it takes is someone walking into your data center, you don't have to go into your data center, outside your data center, and stopping, you know, Bob or Mary or Tom or Bill, whoever it is walking out and saying, hey, you need some extra Christmas cash, you know? Or, um, hey, uh, I'm just in town, uh, you know, the, the guys from the head office sent me my pass isn't working, can you help me out? Um, I have a guy that does pen testing for a living and he just tailgates people in and that's just easy to pot. I mean, that's the easiest thing ever. So at the end of the day, it's all about social engineering. So if you walk away from nothing else from the presentation, and I've seen right now, it's probably going, I asked you to talk about the cloud. What is this? <laughs> At the end of the day, right, the social engineering aspect of, of, of what we do is one of the scariest things that we have to contend with. And that's because it will always win. I can't tell you how many pen tests I've participated in in global organizations, and I've worked for a lot of them. I've worked for uh, Verizon, I've worked for PepsiCo, I've worked for Harley Davidson. Yes. Uh, I work for Barclays, I work for Blackberry, thank God I got out of that in time, uh, and now of course I work for Pearson. So all of those organizations would have this issue. In a few of those organizations where we've done pen tests, they specifically state, do not do the social engineering component. You know why? They know you succeed. Why spend money if you're going to succeed, right? So at the end of the day, Keep that in mind. You've always got to temper whatever it is you're doing with that in mind. My, sli my slides are going to be really crap for you guys. I'm sorry. It's just, I hate bullets. I hate the whole slide, read my slide thing. So look at me. <laughs> it's not that pretty. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so the mission, right? This is what we want to get to. When you think of cloud, everybody wants happy, sunny clouds. Yeah? We don't want miserable, horrible clouds. We want happy, sunny clouds. And in order to get to happy, sunny clouds within our organization, we've got to do several things properly. Now, the interesting thing that I've seen over the past few years, and I've seen cloud really come into its own, I would say, really in the past two years, three years, within the, the larger companies that I've been in, um, obviously it's been around for a while, Right? The whole concept of what we do is cloud-based. <laughs> I love that religious debate. We won't get into that right now. Um, but it's really come into its own in the past couple of three years or so. Um, so in order to achieve happy, fluffy clouds, businesses have to do several things that they may not be used to doing. All right? So we're going to talk about some of those things here and talk a little bit about you know, what are the things that they may not be thinking about. So businesses, uh, a lot of folks are used to and have come from, and myself included, typical IT environments. Now, when I do air quote typical IT environments, right, that means the environments where you've got everything hardwired, uh, maybe you've got a VPN environment, everyone's got a little token, look at me, I'm cool, I got a token. I remember the first time I got a token, I said, oh, I'm a badass now. <laughs> I say badass. Uh, yeah, I'm cool now. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I, I remember that. You know, I remember getting that token. I remember thinking, oh, and then I remember when I got a soft token on the phone. That was just amazing. I was like, I don't even have to have a token now. I'm so bad. Look at this. You guys have that, soft tokens? Some people still do. See those people? Yes. <laughs> so we still need things like that, right? But we need them in a different context in the cloud. So there's different things you have to consider. Uh, data at rest, data in motion, um, data in transmission, those are all the datas. So we have to think about things a little bit differently when you start to move to the cloud. And the reason is, we don't know, you know, are we gonna own the cloud? Are we gonna work with one of the <coughs> vendors and we're gonna use their cloud? Lots of people are shifting to Amazon and the AWS offering. Lots of folks are using Google 
Anybody here at Google Shop? Pearson, giant Google Shop. <laughs> so for me, that was a completely new perspective. Um, I came from very traditional environments. Um, the sort of most out there environment was Blackberry, believe it or not. I didn't know why they went to the toilet. Uh, innovation. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they were really looking ahead in terms of cloud. So I had some exposure there to what they were doing. They had these data centers around the world. They were creating their own personal cloud within Blackberry, doing lots of cool things with service availability around the world. And then I go to Pearson, and one of the reasons I took the Pearson job is because they're doing amazing things with Google. So they're doing things like Google Mail. Employees are all using Google Mail, right? We're doing things like making then the desktop available to our employees wherever they are in the world. Whether they need to be at work, uh, at home, they need to be at work, you know, let's say they're in an airport, uh, they're, I don't know, on holiday and they need to jump online somewhere. They have that Google front end available to them. It also gives us a capacity and availability to um, utilize uh, service offerings uh, for their cloud computing infrastructure as well. So if anybody's been following along with GCE, the uh, uh, Google Cloud Environment, yeah, I think it's right. <laughs> uh, they've been releasing a lot of information about what they're doing there lately and some of the challenges that they're finding and some of the things that they're working with. So I talked about, for example, encryption a while ago. Um, one of the things that Google is doing that's different than Amazon, if you guys ever look into the cloud stuff, is Google is saying, right, we will encrypt all your stuff for you. You don't have to worry about it. When your stuff hits Google, it's encrypted. And they even say something like triple encrypted. Uh, you know, so that's, that's how Google find it is, triple encrypted. Now, the difference with Amazon is, uh, Amazon will say, guess what? We will sell you an HSM, and you can run your own encryption through the AWS that way. So right there is two different scenarios, right? And some people aren't used to that. Some people are like, oh, what does that mean? What am I doing here? Well, we've got guys now coming to us and saying, okay, what about the Snowden stuff? What about this Fed business looking into my stuff, snooping my stuff? How am I going to take care of that? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting thing to look at if you've got Google hosting your encryption, right? I've got AWS where I host my own encryption. So depending upon what your requirements are right there, that may lead you down two different paths in terms of the type of encryption that you expect and want from your cloud provider. So that's just a very high level kind of thing that you need to think about. And we'll talk about some other things that you can do if you pick one or the other, or whomever you pick, uh, as we go forward. Yeah, so I said happy fluffy clouds, not this cloud. <laughs> in case you can't see that in the back, that's a mushroom cloud. <laughs> that's the cloud that happens when it all goes downhill quickly, right? <laughs> this is the cloud that happens whenever you push things into the cloud and then you find out you've not done things like gotten the right SLAs in place. You've not gotten the encryption set up properly. You've not secured in systems. You know, you've not agreed how you're going to let your employees access this environment. Some different things like that. So we'll talk about those things as we go forward. All right, some different pros. This isn't in this laptop. These are all just stock images I grabbed you. Haiku Deck. Anybody here an iPad user? There's an app called Haiku Deck. And uh, I just discovered it a while back, but so you can create these things on the iPad. And they have a stock image repository happening. So I found that image in their stock thing. Um, anyway, I love creating stuff on the iPad when I can. It's like a little teeny tiny laptop. It's like the smallest laptop you could have. So I like to push it. How much of a laptop can I make you be? <laughs> all right, so uh, anyway, <coughs> pros. Pros for going to the cloud. You guys have probably all heard this stuff, right? We've got flexibility. We've got scalability, we've got the speediness with the cloud, we've got the ease of access with the cloud. Everybody heard all of these as pros. Yeah. Any other pros anybody can think of? That's generally the biggest ones that come out of it. All right. Anytime you go into a conversation, people are going to be talking about, look, I can spin up stuff when I want to spin it up and where I want to spin it up. Spin it up means because it's all virtualized, right? So 90% of the time, I don't know, 99% of the time, 40% of all statistics are made up on the spot. 99% uh, of the time, people are going to be running virtualized stuff in the cloud. Yeah, because that's where you get all this flexibility, scalability, and all that. Now, that's not to say you can create environments where you requisition, you know, physical hardware, and then you set it up yourself. 
uh, again, Pearson, Blackberry, some of the other places I talked to, um, those kind of companies are spinning up their own stuff, but they are creating a cloud, so they have to put the physical hardware out there, right? So it gets you multiple data centers around the world, and then you spin up your virtualized environment and create your own cloud. And then what that gives them an opportunity to do is treat that service um, as an opportunity to then push back into the business. Hey, get your stuff out of our physical data centers, get it into the cloud. The reason for that is then when we run into um, issues with um, um, uh, provisioning, we run into issues with capacity, you know, if we run into issues with uh, process or any of that stuff, we can go, because we're in the cloud then, we can go and we can get you a new instance set up. We can push more bandwidth to you. We can push, you know, more processor to you. So that's why people are looking at doing this. And that's why companies are so interested in doing this and taking advantage of this. They get away from some of the hard costs associated with being in the physical data centers as well. So anybody here responsible for a data center or ever had data center responsibility? Okay, good, good. So you guys know what I'm talking about. So right, the problem with the data center is not only are you paying for that site, which is great in and of itself, but then you're paying for all of the physical stuff attached to it, right? You're paying for all the personnel in it, you're paying for all the power, you're paying for all the cooling, you're paying for all the backup, and those things sound easy, but each one of those things has separate things that you have to pay for as well. So anything that companies can do to get away from all of those components of paying for the physical space helps to give them all of this goodness on the bottom. Um, one of the other things I wanted to bring up is uh, with companies pushing their folks into being more mobile, right? So giving them the laptop and saying, here, you know, go work from home, you know, go work from the coffee shop, get out of my office. Um, I found out, for example, one of the buildings I've worked in uh, recently cost 30 million pounds a year for the company to operate. What a building! They didn't even have the whole building. They have five floors of a 10 floor building, all right? 30 million pounds a year to run out of that building. That's insanity. <laughs> so how many different, they could probably buy me a house and I could go work from home, you know? So it's, it's uh, definitely some consideration there for cost as well. When you start looking at making your employees mobile and then giving them um, opportunities to easily access their working environment wherever they may be calling in from. Now, talking about doing that, I like this. I know it captivates me more though, the punching of the face and a hairy arm. That's like the hairiest arm I've ever seen. I think it's fake though. I would expect to see spit if he was really being punched. <laughs> Dude, I spent a lot of time evaluating these images for you people. <laughs> I was like, is it too gory, too violent? No, it's good. The hairy arm's a bit much. Uh, okay, yeah, where was I going? Uh, so, uh, sending people home. Yeah, so cons to that stuff. Right, so let's talk about some of the reasons you may not be interested in this. You may not be looking into doing this. Um, my little pound signs, my little friends up there in the corner. Uh, to this day, I still want to type dollar signs up there. So we're, uh, we're lucky I ended up with pound signs today. Um, the issue is, uh, like I said, if you don't have this environment set up and your company says, hey, you know, we want to stand up our own cloud, you're looking at that initial startup cost. Right? You've got to provision the hardware, purchase the hardware, implement provision the hardware, you know, stand up all the virtual goodness, all the licensing and maintenance and all everything associated with that. The manpower to run that, all right, this is not an easy environment to set up if you want to set it up yourself. Now, that is why you see a lot of companies looking at the outsourcing providers. So looking at the AWS uh, folks and the Google folks and the other players that are out there in the market. Um, incidentally, there are some great comparisons of players in the market um, if you just do some Google searches. It was one of the things I looked at, I said, like, oh, should I put a comparison matrix, you know, who does what? And I was like, no, that's boring as hell. You guys can Google that yourself, all right? So I wanted to hit you with some of this other stuff, like um, in terms of why we choose one provider over the other. So back to that complexity reason. If I'm looking at standing something up, Again, that's something you have to take into consideration. Do I have the money to make that startup investment? And then how do I reap the return on that investment as we go forward? So again, what I've seen in my experience is companies have to really understand, number one, what their business is. Number two, 
how their business is predicted to grow, yeah? And then number three, what is the lifetime of utilization if they push it into the cloud? Now, I say that they have to know those things because you'd be surprised how many companies have no idea. <laughs> or maybe you wouldn't be surprised. But there are a lot of folks out there that have not taken those things into consideration. And actually not just for cloud, for loads of things, right? How many of you guys have ever been in an organization that's purchased some cool technology and then they start to put it in, they're like, oh, that is way too freaking hard. And then they just sort of leave it in the box and it becomes a doorstop. Anybody? Don't be lying to me. <laughs> so I've been in loads of places where that's happened. Um, I've walked into organizations before and I've been like, there's money on the ground. Let's pick it up. Let's make it work. Right? Because you have to go through that due diligence of figuring out what are the questions, right? And then what are the hard answers to these things? So those questions I was talking about, you know, like the, the, the resource, the utilization, the longevity, and the lifetime of the thing. Once you get the answers to those, then you can create your business case for why you should justify and, and spend that money. Now, uh, the next thing I got here about complexity. So the challenges with uh, the complexity of it, you know, I, I just had ease on the last slide, right? You're all like, you just said it's easy. Relax. Or it's easy. Make up your mind. Why did you wear a red jumper? These are things going through my head. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that one out loud. <laughs> Okay, is it easy or is it complex, right? Well, the complexity part of it, like I said, is with the actual setup of it. So anytime you start to create your own, even or if you want to push your folks out to the cloud, you've got to go through this whole sort of process of reinitializing the way that you work in your environment. So if you're setting up your own, I already talked about that, right? Why that's kind of complex. If I want to start to push people out to the cloud, I would say, go do cloud-based stuff. We're working on the cloud now, right? That's a whole new way of thinking for people. Most people come from exchange backgrounds, okay? Anybody here not on exchange? What do you guys use? Good boys still. What is it? Good boys still. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the majority of folks are exchange-based, right? Taking an exchange-based user and then putting them into a cloud-based offering requires a retraining of how they operate. Now, if you're like me, I've spent 18 years working in an exchange environment. I did work in one organization that had Lotus nodes. That's horrible. But besides that little point in time, it was all exchange-based, okay? So then coming into this Google environment at Pearson, it was just kind of like, whoa, I don't know how to work my email. Somebody help me. You know, I had to relearn everything about it. So there was that piece of complexity to it as well. So you've got to take the time to do the training for your folks, and you've got to make sure that your folks know how to use it. What happens if people don't know how to use their environment? They just don't do it, right? They find workarounds. And to this day, I know for a fact in Pearson, I think there's still about, I don't know, statistics. Remember my quote about statistics? I think there's about 5,000 people who are still on exchange. They're just like, Take the up exchange. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, you've got to think about the complexity component. Now, those last two items, SLAs and privacy, I'm going to move ahead because I've got a couple of other things about them in a minute. <clears throat> now, basic got to have. Time check. Now, I just put forward, come on, there's more basics than this. We know, right? Antivirus, also basic got to have. Firewalls, religious debate. Most people will say yes. Some people, well, I had someone, I'm not kidding, I was in a meeting in New York two weeks ago, and the guy spent 10 minutes with me arguing about why we need firewalls or not. And I was just like, oh, that's time of my life I don't want to argue about firewalls. <laughs> I'm an onion kind of person. Anybody here heard that one, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm an onion person. I believe you've got to have lots of layers. I think firewalls get layer to have. We're not going to debate that here. You've got to have basics. All right? Now, the basic basics, hardening of systems. Okay? You need to do patching. Do patching. For the love of God, do patching. I won't even, I, I can't even tell you. I'm not going to go on record saying how many companies are not great at patching. Suck at patching. So we've got to get better at patching, people. It's 2013. And we still are not good at patching. I can't even tell you how critical that is. It is the most fundamental basic thing that we can do to achieve success in security. 
I'm a huge advocate for that if you can't tell. Uh, <clears throat> logging. Now, my background is security operations. Uh, most recently, I've become the security operations center um, queen, for lack of a better word, for some reason. I actually had someone ask me uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they were like, oh, why are you still in SOC? And I was like, I don't know, I'm stuck. <laughs> don't sit in SOC too long, you'll never get out. <laughs> so, with logging, um, the thing that I'm really keen on is if something does happen in my environment and I don't have logging set up, I've got no idea what happened, right? Just basic logging. It doesn't have to be super complicated logging. I don't even have to centralize everything if I can, right? That's my preference. I want to centralize everything. I want to aggregate everything. I want it all consolidated and pretty. I want some to tabulate it. And then I want some analysts whose job it is just to look at that stuff all day, every day. That's me. I'm a little crazy, okay? You don't have to do that. You can just have the basic logging so that if something does happen, you at least can go to that system and you can say, was it a successful attack? Yes or no? That's all I want to know. You would be surprised how difficult that question is to answer if you don't have logs. Then you're looking at like full-blown forensic investigation. And I'm telling you right now, if you don't have logging, odds are you don't have forensic capability either. So start with logging. Work your way up. The last thing, consistency. <coughs> now, again, we all look at that word and we're like, what's a given? How easy is that, consistency? Come on. The problem is, companies nowadays, right, are all being created through a series of M&A activity, mergers and acquisitions type activity. So what happens is, you suck up this company, you suck up that company, we don't purchase these guys, we divest those guys, right? What happens is we lose consistency through that process because, again, we don't have a formalized way of either taking on those new systems or divesting ourselves of those systems. And not just the computers themselves, right, but the networks and the infrastructures that come with them. So the problem is that you get this mishmash of, of networks and IP addresses and, and security systems and, and routing systems and firewalls and that just becomes a big mess, yeah? So that adds to the complexity of the thing as well. So we've got to get a consistent approach. Now, for you guys who are insecurity, that means working with your M&A teams and saying, guys, get me in the front door. When they come on board, have me there. I can help you. Don't bring me in six months later, you know? I want to be there to start talking to them once we get them on board and that company becomes part of whatever it is we're doing. So a very important critical conversation to have. Um, okay, so even better to haves. So I talked about the gotta haves. These are the even better to haves. Thank God my English teacher's not in the room. She'd be killing me right now. Because the sentence structure is horrible. <laughs> so now I say even better to haves because the odds of all of these things happening are probably slip tonight. <coughs> but who wants to train, right? We can all train. So what I dream about on a daily basis is a world where I go into the office and NAC is implemented and it works. Has anybody ever seen a working implementation of NAC? One gentleman. You, sir. I'd like to shake your hand. <laughs> NAC is a difficult beast to set up, all right? I'm making fun of it, but NAC is a difficult beast to set up. And the reason for that is probably because I work in organizations that are too big <laughs> and too complex and have lots of moving parts. Um, but it is definitely something that if you can set up, you should look to set up because uh, when you have folks connecting into your environment, right, whether you're using the Google uh, Cloud environment, the AWS environment, whatever cloud-based opportunity you're using, but that you can create a way for that system to get checked before you allow it to interact in your environment. So that's something that's definitely worth looking at. HIPS, host-based uh, intrusion prevention system, right? Uh, again, are we seeing a theme here? And points, right? I want some type of awareness and understanding of the endpoint that's connecting into my environment and is using and sending and creating and editing and, and taking data in and out of my environment. Now, the reason for that, and I've been saying this for a few years now, is the perimeter is dead. Anybody that tries to talk to you about a perimeter, right? Oh, here's my perimeter. Here's what they There's no perimeter. The perimeter is dead. If anything, the perimeter is a dotted line at best. 
okay? It's all about the endpoint. You've got to look at your endpoint system. What are we doing on that endpoint system? How are we securing, hardening, logging, tracking, taking care of that endpoint system, wherever it goes and however it connects into our environment? Next couple of things here, threat management. So I'm a huge advocate of threat management. Uh, and threat management is one of those weird ones because it can mean so many different things, yeah? It's like when you go into an environment and you're like, right, today we're going to talk about policies, processes, and procedures. That can mean about 800 different things to a large body of people, right? You've got to agree the definition first. So with threat management, the definition that I'm talking about is where you've got a team of folks and they understand what are the assets, the crown jewels of your company, then what are the vulnerabilities around those assets? Right? And then what in the world, what in the environment are the threats that could get through those holes, get through those vulnerabilities, and cause an impact into your organization? That's threat management. A good threat management team has that visibility, that cognizance, and that understanding of what your environment looks like. Where are those holes? And then they should be working closely with your risk management team. So the thing with threat management is, uh, again, it's kind of hard to do. And the reason it's hard to do is because it's hard for companies, believe it or not, uh, I've been doing it a long time, it's hard for companies to truly describe to you what their crown jewels <coughs> are, what their assets are. A lot of companies have no idea. And the reason for that is because we say, the business knows, the company knows. Who is that? Who are those people? Where do they sit? Who makes these decisions? And us as security professionals, we're kind of like, boo boo boo, boo boo boo. <laughs> I wasn't trained in psychology. I think if I was, but, uh, but it's difficult, right? You've got to be able to get out there and talk to the business, and you've got to be able to draw out of them, interact with them. What is it that makes you special? What is it that if an attacker came in here and stole from us, would make the front page news, would potentially cost us some money, right? Would it would uh, cost us some... Um, uh, what am I looking for? Some uh, recognition, right? Uh, to, to decline some downward dog, as we say in the yoga business. I don't do yoga. <laughs> but so it causes some bad recognition. Yeah, we don't want any of those things to happen. So we've got to think about that when we set up threat management. Now, the last thing, black holing. Um, number one, I love that word because it's awesome. <laughs> it just sounds cool. You just go in and you're like, we need to do black hole like boss. And he's like, oh my God, that sounds amazing. What is it? <laughs> So when I say black holing, I also mean sink holing. If you guys have ever heard of sink holing, what that means is your threat management guys should be able to develop an understanding of known bad sites out on the internet, right? Sites like CNC sites, uh, command and control, uh, botnet hosting sites, you know, other known baddies out there. And then they should build that list and be able to supply that list and keep it updated, supply that list to your DNS guys. And then that way, if something gets infected inside your organization, and hopefully it's pointing back to your DNS, and you run DNS, and you can control DNS, and all this goodness. But then you can say, you know what? Mm -mm. You're trying to get the IP address of a known baddie. I'm going to send you over here to <coughs> Dead Wall. I'm going to send you over here to, you know, to nowhere land. You're not getting out of my network, buddy. Nowhere we're talking back to command and control. All right? So definitely something to look at there. Now, I have been in an organization that did this. And uh, it was awesome. I'm not going to lie to you. But the thing that made it awesome is my guys loved malware. I had some guys working for me that just loved malware. And what that meant was they were on all of these boards that you could get on where they were getting updated names and updated information about zero-day stuff. APT stuff, all that stuff that everybody's getting hit with. So if you're going to work black holing, right, you can do the commercial approach. You can take a feed from a vendor, but you also need to invest in some folks that can get out there and search those boards, participate in the virus community, and help to keep you updated and up to speed. We used to catch some amazing stuff, and we caught some stuff before it ever got out to the Internet. And I'm here to tell you guys, if you work with an organization that is on the Internet, at some point in time, you will be infected or you're infected right now and you just don't know it. All right? <clears throat> that was a serious moment. <laughs> All right. I just picked that because the cat makes me laugh. <laughs> I'm 
pretty sure those are sandwiches. And personally, I'm like, those sandwiches are protected. So that's all good. <laughs> so what I'm talking about here is if you do go into the cloud and you start to look at the cloud, right? So all the things I've talked about are in-host hardening and, you know, helping your employees to understand what they need to do and how they need to work. You've also got to talk to your cloud providers and they've got to help you with SLAs, right? And they've got to help you with their global coverage. So the problem is, the ultimate thing that protects us in a cloud environment is an SLA, all right? What happens when, uh, when our data, uh, you know, we, we lose an environment? We need to move an environment. We want to pull out of that hosting provider and go to another, another <coughs> hosting provider. Where does our data go? Who's touched our data, right? What happens if my data from my people that work in Germany, I find out it gets into the States, right? Number one, the Germans are going to be pissed off. <laughs> and number two, I've now got to figure out how I'm going to deal with that mess. And, and odds are the, the cloud folks are going to blah, 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 you know. So I've got to look at the SLAs and make sure that we're protected. Because at the end of the day, that's going to be what helps to cover your bottom line and helps to cover your button. So you definitely want to take that into consideration. Um, <clears throat> oh, the thing with SLAs and the thing with this global coverage perspective, and I just mentioned the Germany thing, right, is that the other issue we have with the cloud stuff is this issue of privacy. Now, so many companies are not thinking about privacy, okay? They're just not looking at it. The issue is we've got more and more regulations coming out, and they're starting to attach bigger and bigger fines to people that are breaking these regulations, companies that are breaking these regulations. So you have got to be the person in your organization that stands up and says, oh boss, <laughs> that's awesome. What you're talking about is cool, but who's gonna talk about the privacy of it? Who's gonna look at our people in Portugal? Who's gonna talk to the people in Italy? Who's gonna talk to the Far East and understand what their privacy laws are? How do we, do we need to send a message to them? Do they need a pop-up box that says, you're now entering monitored territory. You know, your data will be uh, assigned to the, the closest regional data center, which is not in your region, <laughs> you know? What is gonna happen there? How do we control that? So you've got to have someone that understands the privacy implications. And someone that can say, you know, uh, yeah boss, look, we're gonna have to stand up. We're gonna have to spin up a separate portion of this cloud, you know, in this part of the world. We're gonna to have to put specific notifications on um, screens when people log in in this part of the world, all right? And I'm gonna tell you right now, that's very complicated to do, and it breaks my consistency message, right? Because we don't have a consolidated approach to privacy globally. We don't have a standardized approach. Therefore, I've already contradicted myself. You see how hard our job is? I'm telling you consistency is the answer, and now I'm standing up here and telling you, we don't have consistency! <laughs> So we're already screwed. So good thing, job security. <laughs> See, at the end of the day, it's all happy. <laughs> now, if you're trying to read this slide, um, if there are actual real words on there and there is actual real content, um, I'm not sure, I think some of it goes off the screen. You can get the gist of it if you get, grab a copy later on. I think Stephen's gonna make everything available. <clears throat> See, what did I start with? It all boils down to security awareness. Remember what I started with? Security, uh, uh, social engineering. At the end of the day, the thing that's gonna help us the most is making sure that our people are aware of the potential <coughs> implications of what they do on our networks and how to keep themselves secure individually. I can, I can actually wrap this around any presentation I do. I haven't. <laughs> Thank God, I would've bored myself by now. But, um, but, but at the end of the day, this is what it's all about. Now, I want to tell you guys, it's hard, right? You know it's hard. You wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't hard. But we've got to continue to push this message forward as well. We've got to help folks understand what is it that they can do to be safer citizens on our infrastructure, on their PCs, on the internet, you know, in the office, and even when they're at home. Because <coughs> guess what? If we continue to mobilize more and more and more, all we're doing is making more opportunities for people to connect to our infrastructure wherever they may be, right? On a daily basis, I find systems that are iPads that we don't own, computers we don't own, PCs that we don't own, right? 
We found someone's freaking we attached to our infrastructure. All right, so you're going to find stuff that does not belong in your infrastructure. So we've got to help people understand uh, and, and uh, feel the security awareness. And I think that is it for me, sir. So thank you guys for your attention. Hopefully you're still awake and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.